As always, thanks everyone for being here. Um, we really appreciate uh, you coming and supporting these events. Again, uh, let me throw it out that if anybody has any uh, topic that they would like to share out and they haven't had an opportunity to, again, just uh, share it uh, on our meetup page to Brian. I'm sure it would be a wonderful uh, conversation. And as you can see, uh, with today's conversation shows uh, really just how flexible and open we are to many different uh, ideas. Uh, I mean, this is about learning and history. So uh, the topic today is by Lawrence, a member of MM. Uh, the Golden Age of Piracy and the Myths Surrounding It. I'm excited for where our lady came from. So go ahead. don't know me, or don't know me that well, you should know that I love pirates. I mean, pirates are like my favorite thing in the world. I have, exactly, I have read so many books about pirates just in these past few months, and I keep ordering more and spending a lot of money, and it's really bad for my wallet, but I think it's super interesting. And, what? Did you speak into the mic? No. He's good enough as long as he's close to it. I can hear him. Don't worry about it. Yeah. We talked about this. Alright. Uh, so, the topic today, obviously, the Golden Age of Piracy. So, the Golden Age, people have lots of different definitions for it. Uh, some people like to say that it's from 1650 to 1730. But people like me like to say that it's from uh, 1715 to 1725. That was really the golden age. Now, the start of the golden age was really exciting too, like from 1696. That was really where it had its beginnings. Um, but what are some of the things you guys think of when I say golden age of piracy? Doubloons. Doubloons, that's fair. Long John Silver. Long John Silver. Oh, okay. Here. Anything else? Captain Jack Sparrow. Captain Jack Army. Captain Hook. Black Captain Beard. Hook. Okay. Black Beard. Fair enough. All right. Peter Pan. Blue Beard. Oh wait, that's not a pirate. Puerto Rico. That Cannons? too. Cannons. Generically. Yeah. Yeah. Crack. yeah. Yeah. Cannons. All right. Um, so here are usually you think of this rum drinking Jack Sparrow type of pirate who just likes to pillage, plunder, and have a lot of fun having these awesome sword fights flying under the Jolly Roger. That's the stereotypical view. Um, and throw in some treasure, why not, too? Uh, so the legends that I will be going over today uh, will be these. Walking the Plank, Jolly Roger, Rebel or Thief, and Epic Sword Fights. Uh, the first one, Walking the Plank, it is pretty much almost pure myth. Now, just like all myths, it's a myth based on a grain of truth. Uh, pirates never made their uh, captives walk the plank to kill them. Never. That has never happened. The only time that we can find, or the earliest instance of people walking any kind of plank that was off the side of a ship, uh, was in the 1780s. Uh, mutineers would actually do this to test worthiness of potential crewmates or captains. They would get them really drunk and blindfold them and have them pretty much walk this plank and do their best to not die. And if they didn't die, they, they were in. They were worthy, they were part of the crew or captain, whatever, or whatever the hell they were doing. Um, so that was walking the plank. Uh, and it all stemmed from just a few instances of this. It never happened in the Golden Age. That was never a way to kill captives or anything. Uh, now that we have that one out of the way, humble beginnings. This is really when the Golden Age started. And this is by far the story of, or this is the story of by far my favorite pirate, Henry Avery. Uh, so Henry Avery started aboard Charles II, it was an English privateering vessel. And uh, privateers are basically state-hired pirates, for anyone that didn't know that. Uh, they pretty much just had the government's okay to 
go hunt other pirates and also take their own things. They were supposed to give uh, most of the earnings or the plunders to uh, the government, but they rarely did. Um, because if you just get a bunch of treasure, you're going to want to keep most of it. Uh, so in May 1694, Henry Avery was aboard the Charles II. Uh, and the captain, Captain Gibson, was an ex. Uh, he had no idea what was going on with the crew. He didn't know about their plights. He didn't know about uh, any of, I don't even think he knew most of their names except for Henry Avery, because Henry Avery was actually his first mate. Uh, so Captain Gibson liked to get really drunk all the time. He would go ashore every night and get hammered in a bar and pass out. And in the morning, he would come back to the ship and they would ride off into, into the day or the sea or the night, whatever colloquialism you guys like. Um, so Avery was a really smart guy. I mean, this guy, he didn't drink at all. He was courageous and he was selfish. Uh, he was really cunning, a really cunning privateer to be pirate. Uh, so the thing that Henry Avery would do is he would actually recruit people for uh, Charles II. Uh, he would do this himself, uh, usually recruiting people that he already knew, uh, all in hopes of one day taking control of the ship. So uh, we. Hop to May 1694, and Avery wants to take over the ship. So the way that he does this, or the way that they hatched out the plan, was to wait until Gibson got off the ship and got hammered at a bar, and pretty much while he was knocked out, just take it. Just go, just go off with it. Uh, it's yours now. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the night that they hatched out the plan, Gibson didn't go off the ship. He decided to get drunk on the ship. Uh, and eventually, same thing happens, though he gets knocked out in his room, or he passes out of his room. And Avery was like, well, fuck it. I'll take the ship anyways. So him and most of the crew, uh, really stealthily, really quietly, without waking anybody up, uh, they, they take up the anchor and they sail away. And pretty much near the end of that, Gibson wakes up and he calls Avery over into his room. Avery walks in and he says, okay, here's the deal, the ship's mine now. Now you have two choices. You can either be on the ship as a part of the crew, or we can send you off on your way on you know, one of those little boats, those little canoe-sized boats. Uh, and Gibson was like, no, screw it, just send me away. So they sent away Gibson and six crewmates that were actually against the mutiny. And that was how Henry Avery took over Charles II. Now, at the end of his takeover, he actually put up two flags. And this is where we can go over the first myth. So the two flags he put up, with the flag of St. George, and then his own personal, uh, his own personal flag. Uh, it's a f red flag. It's described as a red background flag with four silver chevrons. Uh, that's the first time I ever heard that word, but then I found out that it actually had to do with uh, ranks in the military. Uh, so this is an approximation of what his flag looked like. And then he was also flying the flag of St. George. So Jolly Roger. That's pretty recognizable. You guys can see that and you think pirates. Nothing about that flag is the Jolly Roger. Not a single thing about it. So the legend that usually goes along with Jolly Roger actually stems from 1684 when some pirates were going in to Acapunetta, and that is a city in Mexico. Uh, the pirates were actually on their way to Mexico City to take over. The governor of Mexico City at the time actually had a feeling that this would happen. He, on some level, knew that the pirates were going to come in and try to take over the town. So he hired a lot of the natives around to try to stop 
these pirates. Uh, and according to accounts, the pirates came in with a red flag. And it, uh, now this is something that you may have heard, and it actually is true. The red flag means that they would give no quarter. It means, my name is Inigo Matoya, you killed my father, prepare to die. The black flag, anything with a black background, means surrender now. That you're all, uh, you know, surrender now or perish. And before, oh, I'll get into that later actually. Uh, so as the legend goes, the pirates go in to Acapaneta with a red flag. And they start slaughtering all the natives. They start shooting, slicing everything all the way to Mexico City. And that's the legend. Uh, now the story is true, but people uh, misattribute the Jolly Roger to the story because the French word for Jolly Roger, or sorry, the French word for uh, pretty red is Jolly Rouge, and I'm probably butchering that. But people later associated that with Jolly Roger, thinking any uh, pirate flag. So, uh, the term Jolly Roger was around way before the, or it was around during the Golden Age. Uh, the reason for this, uh, and actually, I can get to that in just a little bit. Uh, term Jolly Roger was around, and the flag, this flag, separate from Jolly Roger, uh, actually started appearing in 1700. Uh, we have a very, or not a very early description, but one of the earliest descriptions of a pirate flag, and it was pretty much described as just a skull with crossbones. <coughs> but what does it mean, and why did we attribute Jolly Roger to that flag? Uh, so, Jolly Roger was actually an old pirate joke. At the time, there was this guy called Woods Rogers, and he was pretty much the guy that took down the pirates. And uh, we'll get into how he did that in a little bit, but he was a jerk. People, or pirates specifically, didn't like him. Uh, and you know what? Neither do I. Uh, so Roger meant a few things. Uh, the term Old Roger meant devil. Uh, the term Roger itself is a term, still is, for the male organ of love. Uh, and the reason that pirate flags became associated with Jolly Roger was, well, any pirate flag, really. It didn't have to look exactly like this. But we know of seven pirates who actually did call their flag Jolly Roger, no matter what it looked like. But none of those Jolly Rogers was your basic skull and crossbones. Uh, the meaning behind it was Woods Rogers is a dick, and he'd be better off dead. So uh, the reason why these pirates would call their flag Jolly Roger was to talk shit about this guy, Woods Rogers, calling him a dick that would be better off dead. Uh, so we know of s at least seven pirates who did call their flag Jolly Roger. Spriggs and Lowe, and I just noticed the typo there, Spriggs and Lowe, they called, they had the same flag, and they, they both called this the Jolly Roger, and that was this flag right here. And there were a lot, and they all had different flags. All these guys up here had different flags, except for Spriggs and Lowe. Uh, some of them had just a giant hourglass with a skull. Some of them had an hourglass with an arm holding a cutlass. Some of them had a uh, death's head with a uh, cutlass. Or they had this full skeleton with uh, a heart in its hand being pierced by a dart. They were all very different, but they all referred to them as Jolly Roger. And as you can see on the bottom, there's a description of Bartholomew Roberts' flag. All right, so back to Henry Avery. His fate, really the beginning of his fate, was in 1696, April 1st. And I should mention that when he took over Charles II, he renamed it the Fancy. Uh, so, Henry Avery arrives at Nassau, and that is, I think, the current capital of the Bahamas, and it was then too. Uh, so, at that time, it was an English fort, and it was failing. 
I mean, they couldn't save themselves from any potential attack. There were just not enough people. It was awful. So Henry Avery arrives in Nassau, and he is actually going under the name Captain Bridgman, because he knows that at this point, people know his name. He's already stolen 11 ships uh, in his short career. He was a very successful pirate. In fact, he was so successful that later on, there was a play written about him called The Successful Pirate. Uh, yeah. Pretty in your face about it. Very creative. Yeah, right? So Avery needed provisions. He needed food, cannons, a bunch of stuff. Uh, the governor at the time, Governor Trot, was like, okay, you guys can stay here. Because as long as the pirates are in Nassau, Trot has a lot of extra people to help him defend the fort. And during this short time, uh, Henry Avery forms the Republic of Pirates. Now this is really what defined the Golden Age. Uh, the Republic of Pirates was a democratic nation of pirates. I mean, it was really fascinating how these guys acted. They left everything up to a vote, and they were incredibly fair to everyone who was a pirate. They, were pretty, they pretty much hated you if you weren't a pirate, but if you were a pirate, good on you. Uh, so Avery and his crew took over the town, uh, but Trot was still the official guy in charge. They were just everywhere. They were in bars getting drunk. They were at the governor's house just crashing. They really took over the place. Um, uh, about a month or so into their stay, Avery caught a ship off the coast of Africa. Uh, word eventually got to the English government, and there was a warrant out for Avery's arrest. Now, the fancy had actually almost completely been destroyed by this time. It was pretty old, it's been worn down, so the, its bones were still along the port of Nassau. And Trot decides to go onto the shipwreck, or to the rotting ship, however you want to put it, and you know, look for stuff, he's, he's interested. <laughs> Eventually he finds out that Avery was in f that, that uh, Captain Bridgman was in fact Henry Avery. But by that time it was already too late. Um, Avery and his crew actually split up into three separate groups and they got three separate ships. Uh, smaller, like sloops, and a sloop is a certain kind of ship. It's just uh, pretty much like a sailboat, a one big sail, and then pretty simple. Uh, that's a sloop. sloop. Yes, a sloop. Uh, but Avery was really smart. He gave all of his men false leads. He told someone that he was going to Devon, told someone else that he was going to Ireland, someone else that he was going to Madagascar, somebody else that they, he was going to Iceland. He gave so many false leads that the English government never caught him. And he vanished into obscurity. Nobody had ever heard from him. That was pretty much the end of Henry Avery. Nobody knows what happened to him, but he got away successfully. Uh, so the next pirate to actually take the torch from Avery uh, and try to keep his legacy going was Samuel Bellamy, or Black Sam Bellamy. This guy was really, he was really awesome. I mean, he actually had the nickname the Robin Hood of the Sea because he was so kind to pretty much everybody. And considering the fact that he's a pirate, that's pretty impressive. I'll give it to him. So on March 18th, 1689, he was born in Devon. And he was incredibly poor. His family, uh, they were just farmers. They didn't make much. The land was starting to go bad. Uh, you couldn't grow anything on it. It was awful. So for a long time, he couldn't do much. He was poor. His entire family was you know, almost dead from starvation. Uh, so eventually, he had to go find work in the city. Uh, by the time he was 13, he became a ship's boy. Uh, at the time, there were these groups of Englishmen actually taking people captive, taking like younger uh, boys captive, and making them part of their crew because they just couldn't find enough 
uh, people to work with them. So they were like, oh, screw it. We'll just we'll t take these people into basically slavery. Uh, so then that's what happened to Bellamy, more than likely. Uh, but it's, it's unknown exactly how he became a pirate, because there are just no accounts of that, no one bothered to mention it. But by 1715, he was already impressing some very famous pirates. In fact, he even surpassed uh, Blackbeard in popularity, even though he was much, much younger. So, uh, about two years later, in February 1717, Bellamy and his crew capture the Weta. And this was built as a slave ship, but it had everything a pirate could want. It was fast. It was absolutely massive. It could hold about 700, 800 people. It was huge. It had three big sails. It was just a great, great boat if you were a pirate. Uh, so the captain of this boat was Captain Lawrence Prince. Uh, and Prince really just wanted to get home. He'd been out at sea for a year, maybe two, away from home. He really just wanted to, you know, be done with the whole thing. So, Prince, uh, just wanting to get home, makes a very bad decision. He decides to take his ship into pirate territory. And this would, of course, change the course of history. Uh, so, Bellamy had teamed up with Palsgrave Williams. And at the time, Palsgrave Williams was another very famous pirate. Uh, Bellamy had Marianne, and Palsgrave Williams had the Sultana. And both of these were really good ships. The Marianne was much better, but both of them were still generally pretty good. What is, what is pretty good? I don't mean to interrupt. Like, what, well, they, they weren't like too massively big. Or were they galleys? How many feet long were they? I don't know. I don't know how many feet long. Oh, man, that'd be cool. Okay. I was just wondering. Actually, there is, uh, I can show you a part of the book later. Please do. It goes over all that stuff. That would be awesome. Basically, whatever makes a good ship, they were like a little bit above that. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> that's galley right. plus. So anyways, they chased the Weta for about three days. And eventually, the Weta had to stop. But before it made it stop, it shot out two cannons, and they both missed. Just, it didn't even go halfway to the enemy ships, to the pirate ships. Um, so eventually the Weta stops, and Bellamy and his crew take the ship. Uh, but in this act, Bellamy decides to be a nice guy. He didn't want to leave this captain and his crew stranded, so he traded the Weta for the, for the worse, much worse, Sultana. Uh, yeah, really, really, really great pirate. Uh, and uh, to further build the case, he never hurt the captain. He never killed anybody. He would just take the stuff he needed and go. If he liked a ship, he would take it, but he'd leave you with something. And if he, the stuff he didn't like, he didn't take. He was very nice about it. Sometimes something would only suit his purpose once, and then he'd give it back. Um, now, he really was, and th this is actually how he was able to steal 58 ships in his short career. He wouldn't need 58 ships, but the fact that he would steal them and then give them back when he no longer needed them, well, now you can see why he needed to steal so many ships. Um, he was really a Robin Hood of the sea, but it was really only to the pirates. The pirates were the poor. Everybody else sucked. And this is one of his famous quotes, actually. Uh, they vilify us, the scoundrels do, when there is only this difference. They rob the poor under the cover of law, and we plunder the rich under the protection of our own courage. Uh, so this really also helped build this case that Bellamy was the Robin Hood of the sea. Uh, he really understood the plight of the poor and downtrodden, and in particularly the pirates. So this is where another myth comes in. Were they rebels or were they thieves? Uh, most rebellions were usually stopped right away. Um, there would be a lot of outrage. People would get angry and start trying to attack things. And then the cops would come in or uh, the generals would come in. And they would pretty much kill a lot of people 
And that was it. That was the end of the rebellion. But the, the rebels in all these different cities, they, they would be pirates. They would have become, become pirates if not for the government stopping the rebellion. Uh, most pirates were in fact just thieves. They were really only in it for themselves. And Bell Bellamy, being an exception, uh, was really motivated by, in his mind probably, the greater good. Um, but most pirates really were very greedy and they were only in it for themselves. So when there, an opportunity presented itself for more, to make more money, they would do that instead. Uh, they would, they didn't really have morals. These were pirates. They were in fact terrible people for the most part. But every myth starts in a grand tree. Um, Bellamy was actually motivated by Henry Avery, who was also a generally nice guy to the crew. Uh, in fact, there was a very important fact that shows that they cared way more about their crew than privateers did or the government did. So naval captains and privateers, the captains would get 16 shares while the crew members only got one. And pirate ships, the pirate captains would get two shares while the crew members only got one. And the first mate would get uh, one and a half shares. Uh, so it was much more equal. What do you mean by shares? Like stock shares? Like, like plunder. Like if they steal a bunch of gold for every two okay. shares. See if I'm, so I'm going with this. So if the captains of the government stole a bunch of gold, they'd get 16 gold pieces to that crew of one. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> All so, right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, question. Sure. What's, the, what's the difference between a privateer and a pirate? Uh, a privateer is a state hired pirate. So uh, <laughs> sometimes they would uh, be hired to capture pirates, and sometimes uh, they would just be there to pick up uh, some of the stuff the pirates left off. Yes? Or uh, what is it, a letter of mark? Hmm? There's a letter of mark, a uh, letter of mark, I think, if I'm pronouncing it right. It's yeah. in the Constitution. Yep, we can hire pirates. We can hire pirates. Oh, is it? Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, oh, cool. That's awesome. Oh. I know what I'm doing later. Congress can. Congress can, yeah. All so right. So they could just go to Somalia and be like, hey, want to work for us? Yeah. Why don't they do that? Well, is it gold, <laughs> is it gold water? Or black water, an example? Of yeah, black water is a mercenary group. Yeah. All right, anyways. So, uh, <laughs> this uh, myth <laughs> of <laughs> rebel or thief. Um, so, <laughs> so, uh, so I'll, I'll get to, I'll get to it later. Don't worry. All right. Uh, so there was this famous story of a sea surgeon Henry Pittman, uh, and this is the story that. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Uh, so good. That sounded so cool in the headphones. All right. All right. All right. Uh, so this this story goes back to 1685. Uh, Pittman was, he wasn't a pirate, he was just a general person living amongst us. Uh, but he wanted to go view an ongoing rebellion. He was really interested in history and wanted to see it happen. So he does this with a friend of his actually. Uh, but him, being a surgeon, uh, he felt pity for the rebels that were greatly injured and he, he helped them out. Uh, eventually, soldiers came by and decided to take prisoner anyone that wasn't dead. And sadly, that just happened to be him. Or he happened to be one of them. Uh, eventually, him and some other pirates were more or less sold into slavery. Uh, and after two years of doing this, they ran into this guy, uh, John Nuffle. Uh, he was in a lot of debt, but he still, at the time, had enough money to buy a ship. So. Um, did I go too fast? I feel like I may have went too fast. Yes, I did. No, All right, no, anyways. No. I don't think you guys see it. Uh, so, under cover of night, they decide to sink a ship, but only temporarily. They didn't actually, you know, poke any holes in it or do anything bad to it. They just filled it up with water until it sank. And then the government stopped asking questions, and then eventually, when the government, uh, or the, uh, the the governor at the time was distracted, 
they pretty much pulled it back up from the depths and took it. <laughs> or, yeah, that, that's how you get away from the government, pretend there is nothing being sold. Nice. Um, <laughs> so eventually, uh, there, there was a problem, because none of these guys were good sailors. They've been on ships most of their lives, but none of them were good sailors. So they eventually get stranded on an island. Now, uh, luckily, a group of buccaneers comes in. Uh, and buccaneers were kind of like pirates, except really they were around before, like uh, Henry Morgan was a buccaneer. Uh, They're like pirate explorers. Kind of like mercenary explorers. Yeah, like uh, Francis Drake was one of them. Freelance uh, explorers. Then. Sure, why not? You can. It's it's all very technical yeah, yeah. stuff that honestly doesn't matter. <laughs> so a group of buccaneers comes in, and uh, they wanted. Wait. I'm skipping things, sorry. Uh, a group of buccaneers comes in, and they pretty much take <coughs> everything that they have left. Um, the ship, for example, you know, the wreckage of this ship, they took out all the nails, they took the, the sail, uh, and then they burned the rest of it. And now, these guys really had nowhere to go. Uh, things were just looking grim. So, up over two, three months in the future, and Pittman and the s remaining survivors see a boat coming their, their way. Uh, that was actually a boat of the Buccaneers, the same ones who had actually left them on the island in the first place. Um, but when they got there, they only wanted Pittman to join their crew, probably because they found out in conversation he was a surgeon, that's what I'm guessing although that was never explained, that's just conjecture. Uh, but they wanted just him. So, Pittman was like, yeah, sure, please, just take me away from this godforsaken island. Uh, and this is actually the inspiration, I don't know if you guys have ever read the book or seen the play, Captain Blood. Have you guys heard of that? No. No? Now you have? All right, great. Uh, I suggest looking it up, it's pretty old, but I'm sure you can still I'm sure you can find the book somewhere. It was actually pretty popular in its time. Uh, and I won't tell you guys this now, but if you are interested in this, uh, this story actually does involve the, the first instance of sunken treasure. So later, you guys can look that up. Yeah. Uh, so we go back to Bellamy uh, and really his tragic end. Uh, in, uh, on April 26, 1717, they were sailing. Now, this is just a few months after they took over the Ouida, uh, and there was this terrible storm. I mean, it was probably the worst storm that uh, that entire century had ever seen. Um, and that's including the uh, 83 years after in that century. Uh, it was awful. Uh, eventually, the Ouida crashes into a cliff off the side of Virginia. Uh, everyone died except two people. Now, one of the people that died, you know, um, not including Sam Bellamy, one of the other people that I find really interesting, uh, there was this nine-year-old kid, John King. Uh, about a month before this crash, John King saw these pirates plundering and pillaging his village. And he was like, wow, these guys are awesome. And he really wanted to join the pirates. He really wanted to be a pirate. Uh, his mother, obviously, was very much against that. But he was so insistent on it. Um, in fact, he threatened to kill himself if, if he wasn't allowed to be a pirate. Uh, and Yeah, he's nine, right? Uh, it's crazy. So uh, according to accounts from some of the crewmates, uh, they were actually overhearing this conversation. And the mother, scared for her life and her child, is very sad when this kid goes off to be a pirate. So I think he would have been a great pirate. Like, if you start piracy from the age of nine, you're going to be great when you're, when you're older. Um, at least at this terrible profession. <laughs> so, he actually died in that crash too, which is very depressing because I would have loved to see where that would have went.
There's an alternate history book right there. Oh, yeah, you're right, you're right. I could write that. I could write that. <laughs> All right. Now we get to the next big name, Edward Thatch, or sometimes Edward Teach, uh, better known as Blackbeard. And I'm sure you have all heard of Blackbeard. I mean, he has been romanticized since he was alive. Uh, this guy is an absolute legend. First question. Yes. What color was his beard? Uh, I think it was red. Yeah? No, it was black. Oh. All right. Uh, so, in 1716, <laughs> Benjamin Hartigold, he yeah, was also a very famous pirate at the time, uh, gave Blackbeard his own ship, his own little ship. That was fine. No, it's not. All right. So he gave him his own little ship because Blackbeard, uh, by 1716, was he was looking to be pretty good at this whole piracy thing. He wasn't necessarily as famous as he would be later, but he was look, starting to look pretty good at his job. Uh, so later, Hornigold stole a French ship. And he actually gave that money to Blackbeard too. And this would become Blackbeard's super famous ship that everyone knew him for, the Queen Anne's Revenge. And that was in the spring of, or actually along the Queen Anne's Revenge, in the spring of 1717, uh, they stole a ship called the Great, the Great Allen. Uh, I forget which country's ship that was, but they stole it. They marooned the crew. Uh, do you guys know what marooning is? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yep. Okay. Well, anyway, island, right? I'll tell, yeah. They just dropped them off on an island and left them to die. Oh. Uh, they marooned the crew. They took all the cargo and they lit it on fire. Uh, and it was at this point Blackbeard was already making this huge name for himself as one of the most notorious pirates that's ever existed. Uh, later on, uh, and this was actually, the Scarborough was a vessel of whatever country the Great Allen was. Uh, maybe it was English, I always forget. Uh, the Scarborough was sent after the Queen Anne's Revenge. Uh, eventually, they catch up to, to the Queen Anne's Revenge, and a four-hour battle began. And this was, there aren't many accounts of the actual battle, but if it was going out for four hours, I can only assume it was awesome. Uh, and the Scarborough eventually had to retreat. The Queen Anne's Revenge was just too strong. It had too many cannons. Uh, the many? pirates were just too awesome. How many cannons is too many cannons? Is too many? How many No cannons? such thing. All right. Anyways. <laughs> and that too many for the Scarborough. is Blackbeard. To comparatively. Yes. I got it. Anyways. All right. That is Blackbeard. Um, uh, his description, this is actually a pretty good portrayal of what he looked like. Uh, his description, uh, he always, you know, obviously he had a huge black beard and he would, act, he would actually dread his beard. Uh, and the ends here, if you see this, looks like they're on fire. That's because people thought that they were. They weren't <laughs> actually on fire. He would actually play a little mind game he would put two long burning uh, sticks right under his hat and then light the ends of those on fire. So when he was approaching a ship, he, he would have this aura. He would have this ring of smoke around him. In fact, that got him the nickname of the Fury of Hell. And people always thought that he was just lighting his beard on fire. <laughs> but that's so fantastic. sadly, that's not true. But either way, it's awesome. The thing is, he was so scary, he didn't even need a boat. I mean, he would pull up to a boat, and people would look at his face, his eyes, his scary-ass fire ring, and they would say, you can have him. You can have everything. I just don't want to deal with you. He was, exactly, he was that intimidating. And even, even pirates other parts of the time, they even said that it wasn't this ring of smoke around him that was the scary part. It was his eyes. Apparently his eyes were insane. I don't know if this is what his eyes actually looked like. He had crazy eyes. But yeah, he, he had crazy, crazy eyes. eyes. Crazy he eyes. has a crazy eyes. And this was a picture of his flying. And no, he didn't call it Jolly Roger. But that was the picture of his flying. Right, now, on to the adventure. 
Uh, the Adventure was a ship that Blackbeard pretty much had to get because the Queen Anne's Revenge was getting kind of old and dingy and they didn't really do a good job cleaning it. Um, and this is really where he had his final stand. Uh, November 22nd, 1718, uh, Maynard decided to, I forget the name of Maynard's ship, but he decided to, and Maynard was actually um, a Navy captain uh, for the English. Uh, so he decided to try to capture Blackbeard. He pulls up to the adventure because uh, even though the adventure was faster, uh, it, was really, it was really kind of a sneak attack. They snuck up on the adventure. Uh, now, the adventure and its crew could have gotten away, but I think that someone on Maynard's crew had one really lucky shot. Uh, the shot actually destroyed, or actually cut the line to their main sail. So they could no longer go very fast anymore. Uh, so, the pirates were like, okay, we can't really do anything, let's stay and fight. Uh, so the pirates, being very clever, uh, they were shooting and making makeshift grenades. Now, I don't know if this is where Molotov cocktails came from, or if those were around for centuries before, no idea. But they would put gunpowder, iron flakes, uh, and musket balls in old rum bottles, and then they would light them on fire, or actually they would have a little, um, like a, a towel type thing, some, yes. something, a fuse. Well, it wasn't exactly a fuse, but it was something to work as a fuse. Right on. Okay. A wick. A wick, something that burned. Uh, and they would douse it in rum, and then they would throw it overboard, or throw it into the enemy ship. And those were really powerful. In fact, altogether, they killed 21, or they, they either killed or wounded a total of 21 of Maynard's men. And that was most of his crew. Now, what Blackbeard didn't know was that a little bit before, Maynard told some of his more able-bodied able men to go Uh, he told some of his more able-bodied men to go below deck and wait for a signal. So just as soon as all these bloody guys were laying on the deck of the ship, Blackbeard and his crew decide to come onto the ship, and that's when Maynard gives the signal, and a bunch of people come out, and this big old fight begins. Uh, this is where the tale of an epic sword fight comes in. These almost never happen. I mean, sometimes pirates would, you know, do this whole thing, fencing, shindig, uh, to practice, but this almost never happened. I mean, there are a few other accounts of it, but this was the most famous one. This was really the epic sword fight to set the standard for all sword fights. Um, Blackbeard, seeing that Maynard had deceived them, decides to take out his sword, and then begin fighting. Uh, the accounts actually say that the battle lasted anywhere between six to ten minutes, uh, just them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but then, some asshole on Maynard's crew decides to ruin the whole thing and shoot Blackbeard. Um, so, the way this all went down was they, they were both pretty badly cut up and scraped and stabbed. They were in a lot of pain already. And then uh, someone shoots Blackbeard, and he doesn't die from the shot right away. He actually slowly bleeds out on deck. Now, there was a, uh, a rumor, but it's probably not true. Uh, there was a story about how Blackbeard's head was cut off and then hanged from, like, the mast or something. That's not true. He just bled out on deck, and then that was the end of it. That's a lot more realistic. Yeah, exactly. All right. And now we get to the sunset on the Golden Age. So by the time that Blackbeard died, there were two other pretty big pirates. Now there were a lot of big pirates in the Golden Age, many of which that I have no time to go over. But Calico Jack and Charles Vane. Calico Jack, or his actual name was John Rackham. Uh, they called him Calico Jack because he would always dress in these fine Indian silks. And uh, in fact, you kind of think of him like Jack Sparrow, just nowhere near as clever or brave. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, but he was very, he was, he was very metro. It's like a poor man's so, Jackson. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and Charles Vane was this super hothead. I mean, he was just angry at everything. He just wanted to fight and kill. Um, he actually uh, did this very interesting strategy. Uh, there was one day, him and his crew uh, were on an island, and they were surrounded by English vessels. Uh, Charles Vane knew that there was really no escaping, because the vessels were just there to wait until Vane surrendered. But Vane was smart enough to take this little ship off of the boat, uh, or off of their bigger ship, uh, and he spread gunpowder across the floors, and pretty much all of his men got together, and while with one person steering, who, and by the way, yes, they did have an extra boat for this plan, um, while the person, while this crew member was steering the ship, they were all pushing it towards one of the enemy vessels. And right before the guy on the ship jumped off into his own little boat, he lit the entire thing on fire. And that boat was called the HMS Phoenix. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> pretty, pretty fitting name. Um, but that, that bought him enough time to get away. But it did show how crazy and how far he was willing to go for his cause, his terrible, terrible cause. Um, but eventually, there was trouble in paradise between Calico Jack and... and uh, Charles Vane. Um, there was a ship on its way catching up to their ship. And Jack, actually, surprisingly, actually wanted to fight. He said that together they could actually beat this ship that was obviously bigger and stronger than theirs. Together they could board and kill everyone. Uh, Charles Vane, for some reason, decided he would you know, be afraid of this fight and he wanted to run away. So, uh, they all eventually did get away from the ship, but they split up into, you know, two more or less equally sized groups. Um, eventually, they were both caught and hanged. Now, before Calico Jack and Vane were hanged, we have to talk about Anne Bonny and Mary Reed. And these are some of the most famous female pirates that have ever existed, and they were really awesome. I mean, they were natural-born pirates. Uh, they were both part of Jack's crew. Um, Jack, and they were both dressed as men. Uh, Jack and Anne Bonny, or they had, uh, Jack already knew that Anne Bonny was a woman, just dressed in, in men's clothing. Uh, in fact, they had a child together. Uh, so, uh, Jack and Anne Bonnie were really close, but then Anne Bonnie met Mary Reed, who was also dressed as a male. They were both dressed as men when they met. Um, and then eventually, Mary Reed said, I have to be honest with you, uh, I am actually a woman. And then Anne Bonnie was like, whoa, me too! <laughs> um, and then I'm pretty sure, you know, Anne, Mary, and Jack all had themselves a fun time, but that's, that's just conjecture. <laughs> there is really no evidence of that, but I'm just going to put my bets on it. Um, and they were actually supposed to be hanged right after uh, Jack and Vane. But they, and I quote, pleaded their bellies, meaning that they were pregnant. Right before they were hanging, they said they were pregnant, and because it was a, a Christian rule, they were like, we can't kill you, there's a whole other life inside you. So they both avoided hanging because they said they were pregnant. And they were actually both pregnant, um, probably by Jack. Uh, so, Mary Reed eventually uh, dies uh, waiting to give birth to her child. And Anne Bonnie is never heard from again. It is unknown where she went, where she even would have went. It's completely a mystery. And, I mean, she's dead now, but... Uh, completely a mystery, but that is the story of how the two women uh, were able to avoid hanging. The two women. <laughs> yeah, the, the two Ironic. women.
All right, so these were really the last great pirates of the Golden Age, and I did have to cut it short uh, because I knew it was going to be kind of long. Uh, Bartholomew Roberts and Ned Lowe. Bartholomew Roberts, also known as Black Bart, although no serious person ever calls him that, just Brian does. Um, <laughs> Bartholomew Roberts, uh, he did a lot of stuff, but he was mostly known for whenever he took over a vessel, whenever he would steal everything, he would always blow it up. No matter where he was, he would just leave a line of blown up, exploded vessels, just wherever he went, just <laughs> usually off the coast of the Americas. Um, the eventually, yep, exactly. Eventually, he did die uh, from a gunshot wound. Uh, and then Ned Lowe was the last great pirate, and he was always a bully. Like he was always just a dick, even as a child. Uh, there are stories of him just being an ass to every kid in school. Um, so he felt very confident that he could capture any ship. He had he was very cocky, a huge ego. Um, in June 1723, however, he met his match. Uh, he pulled up to the ship with his two vessels, and while one of his vessels attacked, not the one that he was on, that vessel actually lost to the ship they were trying to attack. Ned Lowe, even though he had two ships, decided it was too scary for him, so then he fled and was never heard from again. That one thing was apparently enough to deter him from any more piracy ever. But with all the great pirates of the Golden Age being dead, Calico Jack, Charles Bain, Sam Bellamy, Henry Avery was missing, Blackbeard was dead, with all of them gone, it really was the end of the Golden Age of piracy. Thank you.